Uh, yeah, sorry for the delay. We're back. We're welcoming people back in. We had a little bit of technical difficulties. Had to switch out areas on these folks, man. But yeah, rest in peace, DMX. And, um, you know, to recap, we got the, the horrible news today that, you know, the life of Earl Simmons, other known as DMX, um, he has passed along. And uh, we want to remember him by his music and the great, wonderful impacts that he's had on hip-hop culture. So everybody coming in the room, hit us with your favorite DMX songs, favorite DMX lines, what songs hit you the most. And I was just asking you, Coop, man, like, you were telling me about the first time you ever heard DMX, because you said you knew. You knew off top that this dude was special. I, I don't even know if special was the word. I just heard something different and so and we're gonna get to all of this in a minute mm -hmm. i we did one of our podcasts last year where i told you like con falls in line with the dmx's and the tupac's and the scarfaces and the speak for the have-nots and there's something about if you're a have-not and you keep those guys and so right up the street from my high school in charlotte uh was this uh was willie cds up on Beatty's ford in LaSalle. Right. And so I went in there one day, and four, three, two, one was playing. And so you know, in order it goes: Method Man, Red Man, and then Cannabis. And I already know who Cannabis was by then. Everybody knew who Cannabis was. Cannabis was killing shit at that point. Cannabis was killing, killing shit. Like people were talking about him, like he was the next Nas, like he was the next Rock Him, like like on that level, like he's gonna be the greatest MC who ever lived, type of talk. And I can remember hearing X's verse right after him, and I remember telling my guy Hub, second straight week, I'm talking about Hub, this is how far we go back. I was like, yo, Hub, I was like, but, but DMX got the verse, so I was like, there's something about him, yeah, you know, that I gravitated to. And, and, and I, I was telling Hub, I was like, I don't know if Cannabis is going to make a dope album. I was like, that guy got something that I want to hear more of. And so even my first impression of him on that verse was like, no, he had it, Mike. He always had it. Yeah. You know, I think that the first time I heard him, I want to say it was Money, Power, and Respect. It could have been 4-3-2-1, like you said. We're kind of splitting hands. Mike, it was all around the same yeah. time. Yeah. But I guess, you know, his appearance on Money, Power, and Respect was so stand out because, again, you know, it was so much going on on 4 3 2, one You know what I'm saying? You had the cannabis and LL thing going on. Method Man and Red Man are on there, and he stood out as uh, one of the newer cats on that track full of veterans. Master P was on there too, but when it comes to Money, Power, Respect, he changed the whole color of that record when he came in with that last verse. And you know, that was during the time period where you used to wait for that last verse. Now, like, you know, you don't get to the last verse anymore. And uh, and Jadakiss killed that record, by the way. And then I was X, about to say, that's, yeah. that's that's Jada Kiss's best verse on that album, the whole I sneeze on tracks and bless you, I'm special, and Nigga. if you like working out, then I'm gonna strip you. Mm -hmm. like that one. No, but your ex killed it. I think I heard four, three, two, one first, but it was literally like I might have ended up buying a mixtape. I think they ended up on the same CD that I bought like a week later. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it was literally that close. I always thought four, three, two, one was more impressive because of who he was on the tracks with. It's like, no, nah, yeah. that's Meth, Red, Kingless, and LL. No, that's real. So the, so the fact that I still felt him through all those guys, because it's not like like everybody performed well on that track, Mike. Nobody yeah. has a whack verse on 4, 3, 2, 1. No. Everybody's verse is dope. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Uh, Tom uh, Cooper, he brings up a good point. DMX killed 24 hours to live. Yes, he did. Um, that was another posse cut. Uh, from the Mace album, the Harlem World album, and when he got on there, he changed the color of that track too. He was different. I mean, you could just tell, just straight up. When you say, when, when, when you say change the color, it's kind of like when you're saying that it's kind of in the same way ODB or Busta Rhyme changes the color too, because that energy changes mm -hmm. the color. Because Black Robin made his verses on 24 Hours so are really dope. Well, it's just like that record, uh, and we're going to talk about uh, It's Dark and Hell is Hot, too, because, you know, we actually were going to cover that whole album um, on this episode anyway, but that niggas done started something record. I mean, everybody performed on there, but X just was different. I so, mean... But hold, on, hold, on, hold on, so let's say this. When you and I were talking a couple of days ago about what the best verse on the album was, that was...
was one of the verses that we bought up. I believe you bought it up as a matter of fact, correct? It is. I, uh, I also I, think that... Go ahead. No, I think that you're right. I think that's probably the best verse on that album. Now, Mike, you and I think that that's probably one of the 15, definitely one of the 20 greatest rap albums ever made. And that's the best verse on an album like that. So that's a pretty stellar verse. So I changed my stance, know. though. I think it's one of the best verses on the album. I think his last verse on uh, Look Through My Eyes might be the best verse on the album. Mike, I played Look Through My Eyes twice today. Yeah. That's crazy that you say that. So, hold on. So, can we, where are we at? Are we jumping in? Is Let's Hell jump into Hot? this because, you know, when, um, you know, when we were going to cover It's Dark and Hell is Hot, what I wanted to talk about were, like, the five, well, I mean, because it's such an incredible album, and I know we could say so much about it, it being one of the defining debut albums, uh, period, in hip-hop. But I wanted to talk about, like, the five records on there that would just stand out to the point where it showed that X was different than everyone else in his, you know, I guess in his class at the time. And that was one of the records that I pointed out. I think another one that we talked about offline was uh, Crime Story. And um, I think Crime Story, listening to that, I was like, yo, DMX is actually a really underrated storytelling MC. Because when we talk about storytelling MCs, we don't really mention DMX like that. And the way he told Crime Story, that sounded, I mean, it was done in a, a Scarface, a minute to pray, a second to die type of way. Mixed with a little bit of Ghostface in there. You know what I'm saying? And so I, I really wanted to point out those records because it's easy to go to the Rough Riders anthem. Um, I mean, how's it going down as a standout anyway? But it's easy to go to the hit records, but I really wanted to kind of go with some of those songs on that album that kind of define who X was and how powerful or how much of a force that he was in the game and how he touched people. And I think Look Through My Eyes is definitely one of those defining records. Okay, so I'm going to tell you something right now and this mm -hmm. is why this is one of, this is why this is one of the 10 to 15 best rap albums of all time. You can't pick just five songs because that's not fair to the quality of the record. Right. And, and there are very few rap albums like that, Mike, where where you can't go to like five strong songs because I guarantee you, like if you pick five songs, we gonna have people jump up on here that's gonna name two or three songs that ain't in our five. Right. And that's an all time. That's all time classic shit. That's like epic shit. So I, I'm with you on. Look through my eyes. I thought about something today, and, and and it's funny because when I checked right before the show, it's the number one song on iTunes or Billboard or everything right now, which is Rough Riders Anthem. Right. Like that might be the weakest song on this album, but it's the song that's going to help keep his children and his family paid too. Well, you know what? And I want to speak to that real quick before you no, get no. off of that. We were talking right. about the second album, right? And I, I, I listened to um, Flesh of My Flesh, Blood of My Blood, and I, I realized why I wasn't as much of a fan of that album, and it's because it's so much Swiss. Yeah. More Swiss. I yeah. you were about to say that. And I think that that's probably why you feel that way about the Rough Riders anthem, because it, production-wise, just doesn't stand to the other records. Um, I wouldn't say it's the weakest. I think the song with Drag great. On is the weakest. It doesn't fit. Right, right, and right. Wise, it doesn't fit. Right. And there's actually a story behind that, Mike. He was complaining about not wanting to rap to that beat in the studio. I can believe it. Yeah, they had to convince him to rap to that beat. He was, like, throwing off full-fledged, like, he was having a whole, whole episode about it. I mean... he was calling it, like, like I, think, I think the story goes he was calling it some rock and roll shit, some rock and roll bullshit he didn't want to rap to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but... Said, right? He, he sold it because really, man, it sounded like he wanted to rap to it. And he he brought so, it. So can, we, so can we speak to something right quick? Go ahead. When you know the story, when you know the story behind this song, well, 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 that means there's an actor in there. When you can make a hit record, like when you can make a hit record, because it's that technically the biggest hit on this album, right. on an all-time great album, it's the one beat he didn't want. That means he's a great actor. 
Like, like he made us believe it, even though he didn't believe it. That's what actors do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that. I mean, I remember hearing that on the radio back in the day too. And I think I probably heard it on the radio before I even bought the album. I probably heard pieces of the album. I was young, but just that energy from the way he approached those verses, it pulls you in. And so. No, you're right. It does. Like that's what I mean. Like he sold you on it, and he it's did. like so when you hear the story, like he didn't even believe in the track. It's like how he sold us on it, because it's not my favorite track either. But it's like he's such a way about it. Like he's weaving on that thing, Mike. You know. What is your favorite track on the album? I'm with you, Mike. Stop being greedy is one of my like stop stop being Mike. I can remember hearing stop being greedy like like. Like, before it even dropped as a single, like, that right. was the song that was playing in the streets when the album dropped. Like, that was the song that was playing in the streets. Yeah, um, Stop Being Greedy I, I as think, a piece. Mike, I think that, Mike, I think the intro is special. This is one of my favorite intros to a rap album ever. And I think it set the tone perfectly for what was about to go on. Because it's like, when I mean, like, he was on some other shit, I mean, and, I, and, and you and I talked about this behind the scenes, Mike. This was, like, some grown... It was different, Mike. Yeah. He was 27 this, years old when he dropped the debut? He was he was 27 going on 28. And so, mm -hmm. like, I want to speak to this right quick because we talked about it earlier today when we were on the phone. Right. Most cats that are talented the way X is, they get a deal somewhere between the ages of, like, 16 to 20 usually. Right. So a lot of the nefarious things that they may do, you know, illegally drug activity robbery whatever you have to understand that from the moment that they signed in that rap contract and they may dabble a little bit after or whatever those dudes aren't active in the street anymore usually after the age of 2021 20, you feel me right so when you hear in these guys tell all these street stories understand they're telling more of their stories from their youth they're doing these things and they're going back home to their mother's house you feel me mm-hmm this is a grown ass man out in the streets on it's dark and hell is hot. And it's a big fucking difference. Yeah. It's a big difference. The depths of it is, are different. And the quickest way that you know the depths of it are different is just the subject matter of God and the devil being evident, prevalent, not only on the first album, but throughout the duration of his works. You see certain things that already happened to him that just doesn't happen to you. When no, you that's real. Get the lead to streets at 21. You get what I'm saying? When you're still in the streets and you're 27, 28, in and out of jail, at your baby mama crib, at your grandmama crib, you up here robbing niggas, shooting at niggas, they shooting at... That's different, Mike. That's yeah, different rappers don't find religion. Yeah, rappers don't find religion on their first album. So, so also yeah. understand, too, his energy. He knew that he was everything that all these other dudes was talking about. So he's like, I'm about to come eat all these niggas' food. Well, I think that energy, too, and like you said, somebody who is, you know, seasoned and understands the gravity of the opportunity, too. That's just straight up hunger at that no. point. So, so, my, so, so let's break up the timeline. He makes Unsigned Hype in 1991. Mm -hmm. It's Dark and Hell is Hot doesn't come out to 1998. So he was about in line with other talented, super talented people from New York in that era that got signed. He was about 2021 when he made Unsigned Hype, Mike. Right. How about this? He made Unsigned Hype before Biggie. Uh, wow. Before Common. Before, uh, I mean, we can go down, Capone and Noriega. All yep. of those people had albums and classic records before he even got his shape. And so he's really out in the streets for the most part from 91 to 98. His 20s, Mike. Yeah. It's different. It's different. I remember, um, you know, when Irv Gotti kind of like, you know, put out there the original uh, I Got to Make a Move and just being impressed by how how dope the early DMX was. I like and, Born Loser, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, to your point, though, being, being an older person, you know, like you said, when most people were signed and putting out their classes, especially in the 90s, they're in their late teens, early 20s. And the fact that this man was, I mean, praying on his debut album, you didn't have young MCs in hip hop finding religion to that degree. And that right there was just, like you said, a level of maturity and a level of living life that other hip hop artists at that point in their careers just hadn't lived. 
and you get a different product. You just do. It's a different product. It, it's dark and hell is hot. It's succinctly different from other like gangster rap albums, from other street rap albums, and a lot of it is the fact that he really was out in the streets until he was almost thirty. And so when mm. we're talking about the, the top five records, I don't know if it's the best record, Mike, but I think the most important record and the record we all need to look at probably. And I think every and it's funny because I've talked to other people about it. It doesn't matter who it is. Everybody remembers Damien. Oh, and I want to get to Damien. And shout out to uh, Isha in the room. Yeah, She's, Damien, yeah. yeah. Uh, shout out to Isha. She says in her comments, and we're going to get to the comments too, said the demons okay. he experienced at a young age gave him wisdom he rapped with. Uh, his trials and tribulations were conveyed brilliantly in his music, and there will never be another. Yeah, I mean, he had a very unique upbringing. And uh, I think Damien, in my opinion, when I listen to it now, it sounds like he's talking more so about the music industry. When I was younger, I felt like he was talking about, you know, you know, literal demons. But this sounds like, okay, they're going to put this in your face, you know. Go ahead, smoke it. Go ahead, drink it. Go ahead and fuck something. No, I can keep it secret. And it was like, it, everything on there now, when I listen to the Damien voice, Sounds like he's talking about the music industry, and I find it really interesting. That's the only song he started off was like Def Jam, Rough Rider. He didn't shout out Def Jam on any other record. So can I can can I speak to something right quick? Yeah, go ahead. What if I told you it was actually both of those things, and that's part of why that song is so special? Probably, yeah. You know, um, you know the the uh, the uh, um, what's the show Stranger Things with the whole upside down, the upside down. Yeah. So yeah. he's like kind of explaining the reality and the upside down at the same time. Like that's the beautiful thing about Damien. He is talking about actual literal demons. He's also actually talking about the demons of the music business. Yeah. It's a beautiful record. It's a, it's yeah. I mean, and Mike, and if you and it's disturbing, Mike. I mean, if you if you know some things, Mike, and you're well read, you know you can call on certain things, and things will be granted to you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so he's speaking, and and then you see how, and Mike, and then you see how his life unfurls and unravels. And this is why I reference him being the age that he's at. It's like Damien is troubling to me now at my age because I was 17, 16 when this dark and hell is hot came out. No, I was 17. Yeah. When this dark and hell is hot came out. I mean, Mike, me now. Like, knowing that he was 27, 28 and still out in the streets, it's like, nah, Mike, like, you'll sell your soul to the devil. And that's what it's about. Yeah, yeah. At 28 years old, like, you'd have been shot, stabbed, jaw broke, in and out of jail probably about seven, eight times, abused, juvenile home. Yeah, you sell your soul to the devil. Yeah, yeah. Uh, It's a play on desperation, at least from the higher, you know, pop higher ups rather the powers they be but Mike, but Mike that's what the devil do just like that's what record execs do that's what I'm saying it's mm-hmm. both they prey on the desperation of impoverished youth the devil preys on your soul when you're weak yes it's the same thing yeah and he was mature enough to actually articulate that in a way where a lot of guys probably could talk about that in conversation but couldn't put it in a creative form in the way that you know x did on damien i keep looking down because i'm actually looking up the lyrics to the song because you know i do want to kind of take sections of that while we're talking but the fact that he ended it the way that he ended it like you know i see there's nothing but trouble ahead ain't nothing but trouble ahead yeah right and it's it's and then the omen the omen on 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 oh yeah 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 that too I mean, um, man, I, I to piggyback on what you said earlier, man, Stop Being Greedy probably is my favorite X song, uh, at least on that album, but that's more so because of Sonics and all that. But when you start listening to this album again, it ages very well, number one. But once you actually see how his life, uh, you know, actually materialized, you listen to some of the songs a little different. And we all have known X's story. I mean, we've heard it over the years, us who are fans of hip-hop. But it's different when you actually see it happening uh, and taking different stages. So here's another thing, too. You know, I want people to understand that when you grow up a certain type of way, how like, you get desensitized by the things that happen to you, even at an early age. 
Mike, I'm going to tell you, at 17 years old, none of the subject matter on here was disturbing to me in the slightest because of my circumstances and situations. You feel me? Mm -hmm. I heard some stuff the last couple of days where I was like, oh, shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because I'm in a different place. I'm in a different space. You know what I'm saying? I've dealt with my trauma different. And so it's like, you know, it just makes you even more uh, aware of his trauma and his trouble. You know what mm. I'm saying? It really, really does. But like Isha said, I mean, he basically gave us a window into what was going on in his life yeah, and no, a window like, to his soul. Like, Slipping is a great like, example of that, too. And she said that's her favorite DMX song. It's up there. I wrote a list of what I thought were his 20 best songs. Oh, you got I a 20 best it, songs I, list? I think so. I got a tie at number 20. Because uh, one is the convo and the other is ready to meet him. The convo is when he's talking to the devil on his dark and hell is hot. Mm -hmm. and ready to meet him is when he's talking to God on flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood. Okay, so that's a good tie right there. Yeah. Um, some of these songs I picked because you want to know what I, ta I, I, I thought about this today, Mike. You know what I mean? And this is just another thing that goes back to being a father. He has 15 kids and I thought about the songs that are going to make the family money. And they're all on my top 20 list, even though they probably wouldn't be because of that. But they're important because of that in a time like this. You know what I'm saying? Because right. I know we're discussing his music, but there's a whole set of family and friends that not only loved him, but also relied on him. No, that's real. Uh, and that's he, real. he was touring very hard to make sure that, you know, everybody ate too, even at this point right. in his career. Yeah. So you want me to run down my list? For yeah, you? go ahead. Run down your uh, top 20 DMX songs real quick. And this isn't in any particular order. These are okay. just the ones that I think that are the best and or matter the most or the hit singles. Get at me, dog. Stop being greedy. How's it going down? They men, the omen, slipping, what these bitches want, who we be, party up, rough riders anthem, love for me, niggas done started something, what's my name, ain't no way, coming from blackout, ATF. The intro to It's Dark and Hell is Hot, get it on the floor, and the convo ready to meet him. You know, I like that. Um, I love that What's My Name song, actually. I think that was, a, that was a dope my first single. Go, like, What's My Name could go on It's Dark and Hell is Hot. It's my favorite song that's not on It's Dark and Hell is Hot. I agree. I agree. It could definitely go on there. It's kind of like a, a resurgence to Get At Me Dog, in a sense. It it's might be even better. Than, it, yeah. yeah. It's the closest he ever came to Get At Me Dog again. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, man, that's hey, a tough list. Hey, Mike, before we go anywhere right quick, want to know what I thought about? So we talk a lot about like those, uh, how like incarcerated Scarfaces, Brooklyn Zoo, and Bring the Pain are the best singles that came out of the Wu-Tang camp as far as solo artists, though. Mm -hmm. Get At Me Dog is better than all three of those. Go, go through that list again. What, of his 20 songs? No, uh, of, no, you said Get At Me Dog is better than all three of what? Incarcerated Scarfaces, Brooklyn Zoo, and, and Bring the Pain. It's better than all three of those records. Cause when I, I don't know about listen, that. No, 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 because I'm going to tell you what, Mike. It's age better, and you want to know what, Mike? Like, that song was a bigger record than all that, those records, and it's hard record than all those records. So he made the harder record and the bigger mash. And, and nobody ever introduced themselves like that, Mike. Like, like, if you had never heard him, when you heard Get At Me, Dog, by the end of the first two bars, you knew what time it was. What must I go through to show you shit is real? <laughs> and I ain't really never gave a fuck how niggas feel. I rob and I steal because I want to, because I have to. Don't make me show you with the mat. <laughs> Y'all know about now, the trip. <laughs> I'm on the bullshit that got me jacking <laughs> Yeah, I love that record. Then my man in them stay pretty, but I'm going to stay shitty, cruddy. It's all for the money. It's you know, I, I think the only song that I would put above that, and man, it's close to bringing pain and incarcerated Scarfaces, but I'm putting Brooklyn, like I'm putting Brooklyn Zoo it. over that shit, man. Brooklyn Zoo is fucking I crazy. Thought, I, I thought about it, Mike. I <laughs> thought about it, Mike. But you have to understand, Brooklyn Zoo, it's, it, if you just want to talk about, like, on a lyrical content level, I'll give it to you, Mike. But it's like, no, nah, like, he's so in pocket on every verse. Like, there's there, there's nothing that get, the get at me, dog, is missing. It's not. Do you remember that Murder, Inc., that Murder, Inc. compilation? I don't mean to uh, interrupt you, but do you remember that Murder, Inc. compilation? Yeah. 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 Uh, 
You remember the song that he had on there? No, no. He had like a solo song on the Murder Inc. album. And it was just like one the long one on verse. I remember the one on the Rough Riders album more than I remember the one on the Murder now, Inc. As far album. as uh, Murder Graham, man, his verse on there was crazy. Yeah. Now, if that... Why do you think that the um, the Murder Inc. group with Jay-Z, Ja Rule, and DMX never happened? I mean... <clears throat> At the end of the day, I think it really, Mike, it, it comes back to ego again. You know, really, I think what happened was was that Jay was probably intimidated by X because, like, for probably about a two-year period, there's probably nobody that could rap with X, really. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know what, to clarify for a lot of people who might not have been around during, um, you know, the late 90s or whatnot, DMX is bigger than Jay-Z. And yeah. this is Jay-Z so that sold... This is Jay-Z coming off of Volume 2, which is his most uh, commercial successful album. And so, yeah, DMX was bigger than Jay-Z at that I point. I mean, X, X pretty much sold what Jay sold on Volume 2 twice in one year, damn near. Like, I think he yeah. did five and then did four. Or something like that. Yeah. So, um, like, yeah, so, so with that being like said, that. yeah, he was the mark. And he came out the gate swinging. Like, 98, I think that what, Volume 2 came out in 98. They had the Hard Not Life tour and all that. I think that you would still have to give DMX MC of the Year for 1998 over Jay-Z and over Pun, um, who also he's tried. Not better, he's not a better lyricist than Pun, obviously, in 98. He had like, a better I mean, year. I mean, he had a better year, but I, mean, but I mean, Capital Punishment is a great album. It's just not, it's dark and hell is hot. And that's it at the end of the day. Neither is Volume 2. No. I mean, and I think that at that point, he was the one that was catapulted into superstar. How, How about this, Mike? I mean, has there ever been a rap album this great that wasn't album of the year? I mean, it dropped the same year of arguably the best rap album that ever got made. I mean, I don't think there's <laughs> ever... Like, Mike, if we go through all the years of, of, like, rap history, I don't think there's a better album that's going to come in at number two for the year than It's Dark and Hell is Hot for 1998. Well, some people would tell you that um, Into the 36 is a better album than Doggy Style, but... Hmm. Mike, you want to know what after... Want to know what that? That's what I'm saying. So I, I put it's dark and hell is hot into the Wu Tang in the same conversation. I would put Doggy Style a little higher than both. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not mad at that. I think Doggy Style is better than um, than Into the Thirty Six Chambers. It's just better produced, but it's like like I said, Dr. Dre had had advantages that RZA didn't have in the basement, in the bathroom versus in. I mean, you know, it is what it is. Um, I, I do, but we're talking about Akuma and I, and a lot of people would say, a lot of people would say that "It's Dark and Hell Is Hot" is a better album than Akuma and I. I disagree, but with all that so, being said, go ahead. You know, for people who feel that way, I mean, so this is what I'm saying. You're talking about an album that I have at number two versus an album that I have probably like at number like thirteen. 14 so yeah. it's like if you feel that way that's an aesthetics thing they're they're both in the conversation for greatest rap albums that like ever got created so yeah i agree um but yes uh the other part of x's career is the fact that uh it spawned off a lot of other careers too you know uh rough riders i wouldn't know who rough riders was if it wasn't for dmx to be perfectly honest he promoted rough riders heavy on it's dark and hell is hot they gave us the, you know, the wonderful career of Eve. Um, and even, I think they made the locks what they needed to be in the market that they ended up being in. Um, and you talked about Jadakiss really kind of coming to life on X's uh, sophomore album. Right. I know we I talked about that, that offline. Right. So I wanted to bring that up. The Jadakiss that you're hearing uh, up until his verse on Blackout. He's uh he's what I would like to call like a good potential like lottery prospect. Like he's flashing. Like on songs like Money Power Respect, he's flashing. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like you can see that he has talent and that he's nice, but he's not necessarily the dopest guy in the room. On Blackout, Mike, that's the first time he's the dopest MC in the room. And he's the dopest MC in the room while Jay and X are in their prime. And Styles and Sheik ain't no... Sl and so the Jada Kiss that we know 
actually for me starts with that verse on blackout because that's where that whole king of the bar 16 thing started and if i'm not mistaken mike i think he may have even got hip-hop quotable for the month in the source for blackout so think about that in 1998 with jay and x like in their prime and literally selling five and nine million units in a year he's on a record with them with them closing out he's got the first verse oh it's rhyme of the month in the source and it should have been because he smashed yeah, uh, I think that was the the point that Jada became an elite because even on the record with uh, with Big, it's like you know Jada's there, but Big's there. And even if you look at like let's look at John Blaze, right? We don't we I mean at least I forget a lot of times that Jada's even on that record. Ooh, I mean, how you know about this. You want to know what? You want to know what? All jokes aside, John Blaze is a really really great record. It's a great record. Yeah. No, 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 but here's the thing. All jokes aside, if you, you hear Nas and Pun's verse, you should have broke that shit up because it's obviously the two best verses on there. Like, it's... Yeah. I mean, and Pun has the best verse. You know what I'm saying? Like, Think like so? Nas, yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, thought, I thought Nas and Pun were neck and neck on there until he hit him with that, even if I stuttered, I was still shit on you. Like, that, it was over when he did that. It was over when he did that. I'm a Nas fan. I'll tell you that. It was over when he did that. I was like, Psh. yeah, yeah, that guy. So <laughs> I would have actually, I actually would have actually moved. Uh, I would have put Nas and Ray together mm -hmm. and moved Ray up, and I would have, you know, started off and then went from Kiss and then finished off with Pun. So I would have had Nas starting off and Pun ending it and Ray and then Jada. And then Fat Joe at the end. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I just would have switched it up. And I think it would feel better. Because Ray's and Data's verses are dope. They're just, they're just not on the level that Nas's and, and uh, Pun's verses are. And you're not expecting Fat Joe to deliver that verse from you anyway. So it kind of leaves you looking at Ray and Jada on that track. But it's like, it's Nas and it's Pun. Like, what are you? Yeah, that's an incredible uh, uh, lineup right there. You know, somebody earlier mentioned uh, the Rough Riders Anthem remix. I actually love X's verse on that one. And I love the hook for the remix even more than the original one. Because I know he started kind of performing those. Uh, he started performing like the remix hook. It shows other than the regular hook too. But that was the first time I heard Eve. And I remember being in my car. And I heard that remix for the first time. I think it was like on a mix show or something. I was just in the car listening to the radio. That's how I would do I would go out of my parents' house go into the car and listen to the radio just so I could turn it all the way up. But anyway, I remember hearing that song on the radio and I heard Eve's verse. And I thought it was Charlie Baltimore. And I was like, yo, Charlie Baltimore is snapping. Yeah, but that's for real shady. <laughs> no, I did. What's wrong with that? Charlie Baltimore is nice. Okay. I didn't know, I didn't know who Eve was. And that was like the first time I heard Eve. And then... After that, you know, she came with the what y'all really want, and it was like, yo, this Eve is the truth. I like so, Eve a lot. So, so quick story, I met Eve when What Y'all Want came out when I was in high school. She came into my record store. She performed at this uh, this event we used to have. I'm, I'm pretty sure they still have it every year in Charlotte, Summerfest. Uh -huh. uh, what Y'all Want had started popping, so he was one of the acts that got played it to perform. She came into the record store. It was like, you know, the, I think the show started at like five or six. So mm -hmm. it's probably like 11, 12. And she she strolled in there by herself, no honorage. She just came in there like some Daisy Dukes on and a tank top. Was like super, like on some, like, she from the block. Like she was super cool, friendly, nice. She can rhyme her ass off, Mike. She was always one of my faves. I, I think so too, man. I think that, I've always said that I feel like Eve is kind of like the quintessential mainstream female MC. Like, she can speak about a lot of different things, and it's never one of those things where... How about it, this? It's balanced. I she has a really good balance. She, she has wonderful balance. She just doesn't... I just... You know, I just wish she would have did more material, Mike. I really mm -hmm. think that we could... How about this? She's somebody that I really wish we should be talking about as the greatest female MC of all time. How about that? Me too. Cause I think she's somebody because I think she's somebody that has the talent, lyrical lyrical skill, song making, and hit making ability to actually be able to lay claim to it legitimately. Yeah, and her yeah. ex used to go back and forth, man. I, I totally yeah. agree. And um, right, right. 
She came in rapping with Jada Kiss, Styles, Sheik, and DMX. You can rap. I you love that rap. that Rough Rider song, rap. the Ride or Die song. No, uh, what is it? Hold on, the Scenario remix. That too. That was on her album, yeah, 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 yeah. the uh, Scenario yeah, Two Thousand. But Sine- all I'm is yeah. like she, 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 she held her own with some, some, some A-list MCs. Those are A-list guys. Yeah. Those are, A, those are A-list guys. All day. And you know what? I was talking about the Ride or Die song because they didn't put that on that Rough Riders compilation for whatever reason where they um, where they had the same sample as uh, the EPMD um, headband. Yeah. 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 I mean, that was a great posse cut. Hey, you know what I like? Two is one of my favorite X songs. The Into the Rough Riders compilation uh, album. Mike, mm-hmm. some X shit. Yeah, some X shit was, was hard. I was surprised he played that on his verses. When he played that, I was um, like, whoa. Actually, Mike, like, like, how about this? That's one of those songs that I left out that I put in. Uh, I put one of those singles in that were really big hits instead. Like Party Up. I, you, you know, know like, I wasn't a big fan of Party Up like that. But yeah, either, I understand. But, like, but Mike, like, like... Party up is gonna be one of the reasons the family eats. So no, no, like today, no. you feel what I'm saying? No, I like, because here's the thing: some ex shit, the family ain't gonna eat off some ex shit. They gonna eat no. off party up. No, definitely. And the other song I was talking about that was on the Murder Inc. soundtrack was the uh, not soundtrack, the Murder Inc. compilation was Tales from the Dark Side. You remember that? Whoa! Yeah. Damn! Like damn! Like. Hey, don't too many people hit me with some sh- damn. Mike. That I, song Mike, was probably, hard, Mike, man. Mike, Mike, I probably haven't heard that record from within two or three years of when it came out. I'm not even gonna lie. Yeah, I'm gonna go back and play that tonight. I haven't listened to it in a minute either. And you know, we're all guilty of, you know, I don't want to say being prisoner of the oh, moment. We try to give. This is what we try to do here on this show for people who don't uh, peep what we do oh. every week. We try to give everyone their flowers, and sometimes we go into some nostalgia and go on uh, tangents and all that. But I really do feel like throughout the duration of this show, we've been on for about a year or so. I think that we have given X his flowers and none of this right here is any kind of fake love on no level, you know? Uh, but that is a no, record I, that I, love I haven't played Mike. in a minute. No, Mike, I love X. So I'm going to tell you what I was saying behind the scenes. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I mean... So obviously I love a certain type of guy usually because like three of my favorite MCs are Scarface, Tupac, and DMX. They all share very similar traits and qualities and song making abilities that very, very few people possess. I'm going to share with everybody else what I shared with you earlier. Tupac died at 25. Most of the material that you hear from Tupac was actually 23 and prior because you heard most of the stuff from 23 to 25 because that's the death of Roche shit, okay? Mm-hmm. Pac talks with the optimism and the naivete of somebody who is under 25 years old. No, that's real. The EMX talks with the pessimism the pessimism and the darkness and the depths of somebody who is over 25 and has seen some things and been through some things. And so although people feel like he filled the gap, oh, not quite the same thing, and actually more trouble. Yeah. No, I agree. Like, totally like, not the same thing. No Panther T. Like, he didn't have no fundamental principles in place. I don't think he went to no school for the arts. I don't think he got to go around with Digital Underground... I don't think he had a record deal at twenty. No, you're right. I mean, he was in and out of he was in and out of homes, jail, yeah, trouble here and there. Um, dang man, I, I kind of oh, this is what I was gonna say. I was on Doctor Boyce Watkins' show earlier. Shout out to him. And it's funny you mentioned those individuals because he asked me like where would I put DMX like all time. And I told him, like, with, I usually do groupings when it comes to artists like him, and I would put DMX in a grouping of, like, Scarface, Tupac, Ice Cube, Chuck D, where it was more about them making you feel something as opposed to, you know, trying to be nice on the mic or being lyrical and, you know what I mean? Like, this is... he's Conway and Beanie are in that. Yeah, 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 Beanie Siegel, yes, as well, yeah. Because it's not about the lyrical miracle stuff with them. It's not about hitting you with punchlines and metaphors. They do it's that a, too. 
They can do that, but it's more about making you feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Conway and Bean hit you with bars too, though. They special. Yeah. All those guys are special, man. But you know what? Even as special as Beanie Siegel is, was, X was something different in that prime. And I mean, Beanie said it himself. Leave it up the hoes, the X out Tommy Buns. You know? I tell you what, you want to know it while we're there with it. It's like, you know, I always wanted the Seagull to make an album like It's Dark and Hell is Hot. He's one of the few people that I thought could have made something comparable to it. Because when you look at it, it's like Scarface has the diary. Tupac has Me Against the World, All Eyes on Me, and in some people's uh, opinion, Machiavelli. Did you, know you listen saying? to Cameron's Drink Champs? I still haven't listened yet. God okay. Things been getting some traction. I listened to like half of it. And, I mean, it's like three hours long, so... But just listening to Cam talk about his time at Rockefeller and how things were going there and how a lot of stuff was going through Jay and all that stuff because they were able to do their own thing. And Cam made it clear, like, look, I came from a situation where I was two albums in. I had a fucked up deal already, so I'm approaching the game different. But for guys who were dropping their debuts and sophomores, under Rockefeller, where Jay was still really thriving and running in his career at the time, I don't think anybody would have been able to put out uh, It's Dark and Hell is Hot under Rockefeller. I think right. Kanye West sneaked his way into it, and that happened basically under their nose because they didn't know he had it in him. But, yeah, it wasn't going to be... Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. And he's the producer, so it's like, okay, nigga, okay, I done gave you beats already. Right. They, they didn't think he could rap. That, that's really what it comes down to. They didn't think he yeah. could rap. They didn't think he could put together a dope album. And he is self-sufficient, too. And the fact that other people who were rappers on Rockefeller, you weren't going to get the dopest beats. The dopest beats were going to go to this guy first. Because Heart of the City was supposed to be for Beans, right? All these records were supposed to be for Beans, so... When you're getting passed down leftover tracks, there's no way in hell you can make it as dark and hell as hot. Hey, so Mike, you want to know what? You're absolutely right, because I'm going to tell you what. Benny Siegel's, Benny Siegel's best album to me is The Becoming. Yeah. And, and it's because the production to me on The Becoming is so much better than on his first two albums, and I can never really understand why, because I'm like, why did the first two albums of Rockefeller, when they got access to everybody, sound worse than when he goes out and puts the project together by himself, but that's because he actually was able to source it out himself. You're right. The man that's writing the checks, or part of the write, the check writing process, is not going to give you the dopest view. While he's, he's in the he's in the middle of his career, yeah, he's in the middle of his career. If he hits a dope track, it's coming to him first. Him, look, if he passes it. on it, then you getting it. You know what I'm saying? Think about it. Him and his competition are actually his, your biggest competition because we Nas, DMX, and J. Like that's because think about it. That's who Beans was. He, no, he deserved to be mentioned with them around that time. Well, I mean, that's where the ether line comes in, where it's like, you know, compared, compared to, beans, to beans, you whack. And Jay wasn't going to let there be an album out there to even solidify a statement like that. That might have hurt Beans' career, too. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I mean, again, I, in my personal opinion, my favorite Jay-Z and Kanye West collaboration is Heart of the City. And that track was supposed to be for Benny Siegel. And that just lets you know, Kanye could have helped Benny Siegel at least make the fix. You know what I mean? But that wasn't going to happen on J with Jay in the middle of his career. It just wasn't going to happen, unfortunately. And that's sad. And when I listen to uh, Cameron on Drink Champs, you kind of get an inside of how things were going. Not to mention how... Uh, Oskino was talking about how Jay would make them rhyme in front of him every day and then he would kind of take some of the lines and all that stuff so it's like with things like that going on there's no way that anybody on Rockefeller at the time could have made it as dark and hell as hot 
So, so, so back up for a second. Let's go back to Damien. That's that record exact side of the devil side of it that he's talking about. Yeah. Where you got, yeah, like that. That's it right there. Like you're you're, you're spitting it out right now. Because here's the thing about it. When you got, because here, and I'm gonna say this again. Like once again, all those dudes, Oskino, Chris, Beans, all of them. I think Beans and a couple of them might have been 21, 22, 23, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, Mike, maybe. And so, you know, it's easier for you to be able to get away with certain stuff with that guy that's 21, that wants out of the streets already, over that 28-year-old guy that's already been, and he like, no, nah, motherfucker, give me everything. Well, X didn't look at Jay like that anyway. You know what I'm no, saying? I'm like, just, yeah. No, no, I'm just, saying, I'm just saying a certain mentality in terms of who you can take advantage of and who's really looking for what. Right. Because it's a whole situation where Irv really set up Jay and X's situation. He you did. know what I mean? He did. Jay's situation got set up a full two years before X. Jay's running around signing everybody, so let's not make it seem like that that wasn't an option. That was in play. Big L was about to sign to Rockefeller before he got murdered. Yeah, supposedly, yes. And, and you know, I don't know how great of a move that would have been for him either. Because, again, you always hey, hear hey. that, you know, um, Jay was stunting people's growth and all that. But when you hear these stories and how things really went down, it, it's pretty clear that that's what was going on. Cameron also told that story about... Um, him deleting Jay's verse on uh, the Old Boy remix. You remember that? And uh, basically, he told a side of it that I had never heard. He said that um, him and Santana, they were on that Petey Crack song, like one for Petey Crack and two is for free or whatever. And so yeah. they were really rocking with Petey because Petey was telling them, like, look, I ain't got no deal. I'm not signed to these guys. And, and Dane was like, oh, he stayed property. And basically, Dane was telling... Cam that he couldn't sign P.D. Crack because he was from Philly. They are from Harlem, so they wanted to keep all the Philly guys together or whatever. Cam's like, man, whatever, whatever. You know, I ain't even I ain't even sweating any of that shit. But anyway, they recorded the song and P.D. Crack, I guess, came and told Cam that Jay was in the studio, listened to the shit and just deleted Cam's verse off of him. And so, you know, Cam was like, <laughs> okay. And so when he came in, he said when um, they were leaving the studio, he was going into the studio, Jay kind of walked out of the studio, so, yeah, I got something for you in there type thing, you know. And so he goes in there, and I guess it's Jay's version of, or remix to Old Boy, he gave him a verse, and he kind of gave it to him like he just gave him a gift or something. And then Cam said, you know, delete. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> delete my verse, delete his verse. So that's what it was. Good for Cam. Yeah. And, you know, and I think a lot of that was going on, uh, you know, at that camp at the time. And it was very hard for anybody to grow outside of that and become a bigger artist. Again, Kanye West was a mistake. And the diplomats were kind of like their own machine. But, yeah, I think Beanie Siegel might have been the biggest person that suffered from that. Because, like you said, he had that kind of talent where he could have possibly given us a dark and hell is hot. I think feel it in the air lets you he know. Has, he has the depth that X has, and he's a better lyricist. He doesn't have the energy that X has. I think uh, X has oh. the ability to make hit records that... I mean, X, yeah. X, is, X, is, X is energy, like I said. When you're talking energy, he's like Busta Rhymes, Red Man, ODB. That's a different level energy very few artists have ever had, so I don't know if it's com fair to compare his energy level. Personally. Have you ever seen him live? Yep. How was that? And when was that? Huh? When was that and how was that? 99 and he's great and he was on stage by himself and he don't need no damn body on stage with him. Oh yeah. And he led everybody in prayer at the end of the show. Those are real too. Like those stories about how he leads the, the crowd in prayer at the end and all that. Like that's real. Now you know we, we talk about voices in hip hop too. Like in 2000. Okay. We talk about voices in hip hop too, like, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, the Rock Hymns, Chuck D's, Method Man. Where do you think DMX ranks, you know, Tupac too? Where do you think DMX ranks when you talk about like voices in hip hop, like having the best hip hop voice, rap voice, excuse me? 
So <clears throat> something that I noticed today, because it's been a long time since I listened to It's Dark and Hell is Hot, mm -hmm. and then my flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, from beginning to end, he has rare command of his voice that very few rap artists have ever had. In terms of vocally, he knows exactly what he is doing, how he is doing it, and how to execute it properly. I heard on just those first two albums, him go through probably about four to five different vocal inflections mm -hmm. while he's delivering the rhyme and then jumping back into another one of the vocal inflections. Yeah. Okay. Just getting your timing right on a verse when you're bringing his type of energy is hard, but then be able to vocally be able to do it. And Mike, I mean, and you and I know this, Mike, I'm going to tell you something, Mike, you can hear when somebody's spitting their shit all the way through and when somebody jump in, can't you? Oh yeah, like, definitely. Of they course. Recorded it, right? Yeah. Mike, he doing this shit without jumping in. Like I was listening for him, like where to jump in at? I'm like no, I'm like he's switching his voice live while he recording it. That's rare, Mike. Like I was <laughs> telling you, Nas and Rock him can't do that. You Nas know what? that Nas little section that he did on decibels two two levels lower and then two levels higher within a half a bar and switch back and no. Nah, you know Great. that that little section that he did on Crime Story when he was like, uh, "I'm not." <laughs> I just act right. like it's a, yeah, it was like, I'm not dressed. Be the woman at the door. Right? Yeah, it's like that man sounds very dangerous. I hope you're making a rest. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then he went back to his voice. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Man. And That's you know, like, 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 stop being greedy. That the whole song is like that. Mike. Out the gate, it's stop rare. being greedy was one of those that just was spellbound because it was like, dude, what is he doing right now? He showed you like the two sides of him, like the raw and the calm down version. Because again, I think we were talking about offline how Busta Rhymes is able to do the raw raw, and then he came with the um um uh, hit you with no delay. And so what you're saying, yo? And a lot of that was because you know Puff and Q Tip pulled him to the side. It was like, look, man, you got to kind of diversify what you're doing because you don't want to just be known as the raw raw guy, or whatever. Anyway. X did this in one song at the same time and it was he showed you so, that side and the other side and that's not so easy he, to do. So here's the thing with, with, with Stop Being Greedy too because here's what Stop Being Greedy always was to me. Stop Being Greedy is the angel on his shoulder talking to him and then the devil on his shoulder talking to him. So I don't like drama but I, so I say to myself stay focused on this rap shit and pray for the wealth I want the money. Give me the honey with big gaspers and all the champagne that you got in big glass. But then mm -hmm. it switches, Mike. But see, I think the impressive part is the fact that he was able to hone in to, I guess, what was his original rap voice and go into this new DMX the thing. Rap voice. Yeah. Because you listen he to his early stuff, four. he sounded right, like that four, guy. Voices. He's got four or five different rap voices yeah. and he knows them all well. And Mike, here's what I mean. Some of the stuff was disturbing to me. It's like, Mike, he does those different voices and interpretations so well. And if you know his story and see the things that he's happened to him, and now as I look at the subject matter as a grown man, it really be making you uncomfortable damn near. Like, was fam possessed with something? Did he have multiple person? Now, that's what I'm saying when yeah. it's like, oh, no, some of the stuff is a little uncomfortable as a grown man when you start looking at the big picture of it. Mm -hmm. Like, he does... He does that vocal in so well, like there's a whole nother person inside of him, Mike. Yeah, it sounds like it, you know? It, it, and it like sounds so person. real. Yeah. It, it sounds super real, like, man. You know, yeah, it's too, it, Mike, it's, it's too real. I mean, it's too real, it's too raw, and, you know, I, I think that he kind of, and I'm not just saying this, and I think we've always said this, I, I think he kind of stands alone. It's very tough to even compare him to a lot, especially with the force that he came in, because a lot of guys who rap the way that he raps and makes music from the perspective that he makes, they don't become mega stars. Again, we're talking about like a Scarface, you know, like Scarface is, in my opinion, top 10, easy, and one of the greatest to ever do it. But as far as like on a mainstream level and selling out Woodstock and all that, that wasn't who he was as an artist. But the fact that X was able to kind of do those things that Scarface did and make you feel in that way and still be super mainstream like that, that's different. 
Yeah, you know, you know, it's rare. You you want you want to know what too? So let's talk about how he specially is, even in reference to somebody like Scarface, because Scarface and DMX are the type of guys because of how how much credibility they literally have in the street. They could probably come down here, Mike, and both of them have, and literally like walk around. Yeah, with, like security or nothing. You freestyle them no in problem. the crowd. Like like, like yeah, and it ain't no, ain't nobody about to give them no flex or nothing. No. But uh, DMX gonna sell out Phillips probably. Scarface is not, and I, and I have Scarface higher than DMX, but I know who X is, and X is still in my top twenty because of that. I would have to say, where did we have him? I think when we did our list, I think he was seventeen. Something like that. I mean, I've always said I think, that. X is... I think I think that's about accurate. Well, yeah, we'll we'll revisit that list too, but. Also, too, and I'm going to say this, Mike, too. It's like, how about this? If you actually were to go look at, like, most people's lists, the only guys who are going to make your top 25 that aren't really considered to be top-level lyricists on some sort of error, or even for their level, is going to be Scarface, Tupac, and DMX. Yeah, uh, and I guess maybe Ice Cube, too, right? No, Ice oh. Cube, no, I think I, no, no, no. Ice Cube is. I think Ice Cube is always considered to have been a lyricist and a storyteller first. Yeah, he is. He is definitely. He um, is. Now, yeah. I think Tupac's a storyteller. Too. Yeah. No, he is. Yeah. I just mean like you know people don't respect uh, Scarface's and uh, Tupac and DMX's lyrical capability the way they respect even Beanie Siegel's or Conway's or Black Pop. They're not one of those guys on the mic. But it's interesting that's because super, when you look at like a murder gram. That's, that's, that's super lyrical miracle stuff you be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny though because when they get on those tracks with certain people who are lyricists, he can get down and do that. Like DMX can get down and get lyrical. No, with you. no so one of the things that, I, that, that, that uh, really struck me about his Dark and Hell is Hot is how versatile the production is and how mm-hmm. versatile X is. Wildly versatile on that album. I like think when you go that, to crime story, how's it going down? Stop being greedy, Damien, look through my that's a lot of levels that you're hitting and and, and production wise, they're hitting him with the beats that are matching his levels. The samples are eerie and coming from uh from scary movies. It's like no, it's it's an excellent project. I mean with that being said, with like X is coming and stuff that's frightening in that way and horrific, how's it going down is even that much more impressive. And the that's fact that I mean he was able to Make a legit record, tone down record for the ladies at that point. It's crazy. So, Mike, I understand on X is Coming. I mean, you know what he's talking about doing to a girl if she over 15 on X is Coming, right? Right, 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 right. And then, so to be able to say something like that, and then to be able to execute a record like How's It Going Down, that's what I'm talking about, where it'd be making you think, like, hold on, like, you switching speeds way too much. Is he, he got issues, Mike? Oh yeah. Like like that's two separate of, of trains of thought. So we're dealing with somebody that even we didn't even realize it maybe all the way early on that was internally struggling with some things, multiple personalities mm-hmm. going on. I mean Scarface made it clear that he had schizophrenia and a lot of that was clear in the in the music and the verses and 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 the verse that I think is one of the greatest hip hop verses of all time, the third verse on Mind Playing Tricks on Me. He described all of that to a T perfectly and yeah you have to be going through something to really execute on some of these things to perfection like this so it's funny that you say that i've seen nothing but dmx all day but uh, one person i saw post the multiple times and post videos of him. guess who scarface because he understands mike yeah uh probably you know and, and and when probably more, than, probably more than any other rapper i'm talking mentally psychologically mm-hmm. emotionally and you know when we when we posted earlier uh, when DMX was on IG Live last April uh, during the pandemic or whatnot, and I think it was like right after um, Scarface hit, you know, being diagnosed with the coronavirus and all that, he was giving peace out to Scarface, and really I think that was part of why he even did the live because he was praying for Scarface and you know everything that was going on in the world and just putting out good vibes, so. Those two, uh, I don't know how close they were per se, but obviously kindred spirits in in hip hop. And I know that X was a huge fan of Scarface, and I would imagine vice versa. 
So that's that's one of those things, Mike, and this is what I mean. It'd be deeper than rap, and this is what I mean. So you hear both of those guys talk about God probably more than you find any other rappers talking about God. And mm-hmm. so there's a thing about having a relationship where you kind of know your tribe when you see it. Yeah. And they're from the same tribe, so they see each other very well. Right. I'm actually going to uh, Scarface's page now and see what you're talking right. about. Yeah. 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 He, he did multiple posts today, Mike. Everybody yeah. throwing up their old pictures from when they hung with DMX whenever they hung with him. Like, basically, yeah. Yeah. I see recent stuff. I see old stuff, man. Right. Yeah, right. man. Right. That, that, right. That's sad, man. Like, right. yeah. But so Face is at a certain type of way. Face is definitely like, a student face, of the game, face, and he gets more face, respect face. than anybody. I think the respect that I think the most respected people in hip hop that you see, obviously Rakim gets the the red carpet that's rolled love. out for him whenever. That's love. No, no, <laughs> you said respect. That's love. Yeah, but Nas too, man. Nas is another one that gets all kind of respect and love. Uh, the, and no, Scarface no, no, is no, another. No, no, no. So I want to qualify a few things. No, no, no. Rakim gets love. Nas gets reverence. Scarface gets respect. Yeah, yeah. And, and they intermingle themselves in a lot of ways. But with Rakim, the feeling is love. With Nas, the feeling is reverence. With Scarface, the feeling is respect. I mean, when, you, when you're when out there with Rakim, man, you don't even feel like he's a real person. And, you know, I don't That's really like... That's what I'm saying. It's love. It's like yeah. it's the God. I, and, you know, I don't like doing that to human beings. But, I mean, it's... uh. We're grateful for a lot of things that he was able to um, lay down in this game. And I think X is one of those guys, too, though. I think that the love that people have for DMX and what he's done in his career and what his music and his legacy is, I mean, from just, you know, working according to hip-hop, I see how much love DMX gets and has always gotten. So, you know, I, I, I I saw a game post you know, something about, you know, something along the lines of fake love to, um, you know, to, to kind of paraphrase it. But, I, I mean, I never saw that with our following it according to hip-hop. People always have loved DMX. Every time Slippin's posted, every time How's It Going Down's posted, every time, you know, Get At Me Dog is posted, people are with it. People love X. I, I, and, you know, and every time he's been going through whatever he's been going through, making a comeback, people were excited. We saw it with the verses. Like, people were really ecstatic with the verses. And even though, <laughs> you know, we, we kind of looked at it from a, okay, this person versus this person, and we know Snoop Dogg's catalog is illustrious, and we know that sonically he got the Dr. Dre stuff. We still enjoyed it and celebrated, you know what I'm saying, just two guys who are icons in the culture coming together. So, I mean, yeah, people were excited about it. There's never been a point where people didn't seem like they loved what X had going on. No, so let's talk about, you know, <clears throat> okay, so he obviously, I mean, he lost that battle to Snoop. Right? You lost the verses? I think but, so. I mean, but you know, Snoop is Snoop. I, I think, think I, this is, hold, let, let me say this. Snoop oh, would have beaten yeah. anybody that night. I think Snoop would have beat Jigga that night with that lineup he had. I'm just saying. That's what I was about to say, Mike. I was like, I don't know if anybody, when I looked at that track list, I was like, yeah. ain't nobody getting 11 off of that track list. Nah. Ain't nobody getting 11. It's 20 songs, right? You got to get 11. You're yeah. not getting 11 off that track list. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. And, 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 and Mike, and I felt like X got about seven or eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, the love that Snoop was showing, man, and, you know what I'm saying, and, and grooving, and they were having a good time with it, that was special, man, because... X is real. It's hard not to love him, Mike. It, I, I love the extension of it, though. It was like, you know, Snoop is Snoop, man. You know, and at the time, obviously, Snoop is, I think, probably the most famous rapper ever, right? I would say either him or Kanye West, maybe Tupac. Snoop didn't have to do that. That was well, yeah, that was him showing love. You know what I'm saying? X deserves the love. He That's does. What I'm saying. Like, like, 
like how about this when you're saying okay so here's what i'm saying so they did the verses the next one like seven or eight of those well it's like let's go look at doggy style and let's go look at it's dark and hell is hot it's like that's about right yeah doggy style so doggy style it's dark and hell is hot ain't that far off and it's like you can kind of see that in the verses it's like you got doggy style in the chronic i got it's dark and it's hell is hot and flesh of my flesh i'm fucking with you that yeah. so x is great Think about it. Like, he, he was going up against Doggy Style in the Chronic, and he was winning records, Mike. Like, yeah. It was cool seeing both of them being a fan of each other's work, too. Like, when uh, Snoop was rapping his verse on Bitches Ain't Shit, X was over oh. there going crazy. He was. <laughs> hey, who won, what's, hold on. Who, who won the What's My Name? Did Snoop win What's My Name? They both I, I think what's so. My I think so. I mean, you and I just talked about how much I love uh, DMX's "What's My Name," but "What's My Name" is probably my favorite song on Doggy Style. So yeah, it's not better than the Shiznit, but I love that group. Yeah, yeah, yeah I feel you. Yeah, you know, we didn't talk about this. Did you see? Uh, speaking of verses, did you see the Osley Brothers and uh, Earth Wind and Fire? Yeah, I seen Mr. Biggs and Company. Okay, Who? so you want another story? Go ahead. I met Earth, Wind, and Fire in my early 20s in Orange County, California. I actually worked the VIP room for them after one of their shows. I took care of their wives while they were performing, and then them when they got back. They were some of the nicest and classiest people you would ever want to meet in your life. Seems like it. I, you know, I used to work with uh, Philip Bailey's niece, and uh, you know, they're some cool guys. <laughs> My class personified. Yeah, like, probably the best like, band of all time. You like, know, like, I, I've met almost anybody who you want to meet, but there are very few people that I tell you that I'm pleasured and honored to have met. I felt like that about people. Cool and the Gang, man. I met them over at the Delta Sky Club, and I was uh, I was talking to Cool from Cool and the Gang, and didn't even really know it, and. You know, the guys had all their instruments and all that stuff. And usually when you're in the international uh, Sky Club, you know, you see that a lot because you got people who are out here doing world tours and all that stuff. And so, you know, I was asking them, like, well, <laughs> who you guys playing for? It's like, yeah, we're cool in the game. Yeah. But no, nah, they was cool as hell, man. Um, but I was going to ask you, man, and, and they have an incredible catalog, too. I, I think a lot of people don't really understand what all they brought to the game, either. I was going to ask you, though, what, who did you think uh, came out on top, the Osley Brothers or Earth, Wind & Fire? Because I know I said last year, I said nobody wants it with the Osley Brothers. You heard I said Mr. Biggs and the rest of everybody else, right? Okay. I don't know, man. I said what I said, so. but when I looked at the track list, I don't know, man. Earth Wind and Fire might have actually won. I, you know, I'm, I'm scared to actually put out a score because I might have been proven wrong. Earth Wind and Fire came out swinging. They came out swinging. At least at the beginning part of it, I think yeah. the first eight rounds, Earth, Wind & Fire probably was up like a good 6-2. to two. I was and thinking 5-3, but I think the but I think the ain't the rest of it damn near the Isleys though, Mike, or did you feel Not like towards the before? end. I don't think towards the end. I'm going to have to... Like was, hold on, Mike. I felt like they both went on runs. Like, I felt like there was a run where Earth, Wind & Fire won, won like 4-5 in a row, but then I felt like the Isleys did the same thing. But then it start kind of evening up a little bit, and then you have, I think it was smooth sailing versus like September or something, and it's like, oh, that's, that's September. Of course it was, and that's what I'm saying. Like it, because it was like Earth, Wind, and Fire had some big songs that were going against some Osley Brother songs that were marginally big. You know what I mean? I think. But hold on, so I was about to speak this to the Isley brothers, it's like... I'm about to find this real quick, that's why I'm looking down. Like, it's all marginally big, but it, damn it, it just sounds so good though. Oh yeah. Their stuff hits different. No, it was Smooth Sailing versus Fantasy, and that that kind of, that kind of had me stuck, like... That's they're a whole, the Isley Brothers are a vibe, Mike. They're they a are. Wave, you know what I'm saying? They're a vibe. That's like, what I said, and that's why I said what I yeah. said that nobody wants it with them because those electric guitars, 
Make that's them what I'm different. saying, Michael. They start vibing, they get into a groove. Maybe they didn't do the best track selection in the word, world in terms of sequencing and stuff, or, or, or putting it up against, but like the music's there. Uh, yeah, the last one was Who's That Lady versus September. That's what it was. That's the one that September went against. So, this yeah, is how we started out. This is how we started out. September, but Who's That Lady is great. It is great. So it is great. But this, I mean, Hold on, Mike, but I think September might be Earth, Wind, and Fire's best record. Possibly. It's one of them. I think that's the way the world is, but, you know. I was thinking After the Love is Gone, Reason, mm. This is Alright, let me go down this real quick. I know we Earth still on our fire. show. Uh, since, that's the way of the world. Since I got it pulled up, right? Like, you know, Mike, that's the way of the world. You're right. Yeah, it's a beautiful record. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's a beautiful record. Um, anyway, so it starts off, Ozzy Brothers play... Uh, love the one you with, and then Earth, Wind, and Fire starts it off. But that's the way of the world. Boom, Earth, Wind, and Fire. This so hard of mine. I love that record. But then they come with Let's Groove. Check. And then it's like Hello, it's me. And then they come with Keep Your Head to the Sky. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> on. Okay. See, and, I, like, I like Hello, it's me more than Keep Your Head to the really? Sky. Really? I disagree I do. with that. I do. And then they go with At Your Best, and then they come with Reasons. I think At Your Best is better than Reasons. Really? Yes. And I'm an Ozzy Brothers yeah. fan, and I'm a fan of both That's of them. That's what I'm but. saying. Like, 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 but when I'm in a groove, Mike, I, would, I, I get why people, like, Reasons is a bigger hit. At Your Best is a better song than me. It's a better melody. It's a better groove. It's a better song. It's a beautiful rap. Beautiful rap. Song to me. That's what I'm saying. You're Andre Shashir says Reasons is better. I'm with Andre. You're a positive force within my life. It's a beautiful record. Beautiful I record. Feel the need to wonder why. Let me know. <laughs> All right, and then you got Harvest of, Harvest Mike, for the Mike, World. That's a, Mike, Mike, that's that player shit. Mike, when they start saying that, that's when you grab her hand. Mike, that's when that's when you move. <laughs> <laughs> they got Harvest for the World, and that goes up against. Got to get you into my life. Now, I'm going with Harvest for the World on that one. Me too. I, I got to get you in my life is a little overrated to me. That's one of their hits to me that's overrated. This one was hard for me. Groove with you and Love's Holiday. Groove. As much as I love that's Groove with you, I man, I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted. I'm not, Mike. It's Groove with you. That's what I'm saying. How about this? All those records where it's like, uh, I, I lean towards the Isleys mostly, except for a couple records like Serpentine Fire. That's the way of the world. September reasons is close, but but the song that it's up against, Mike, like just for me. I played Love Holiday just to make sure I wasn't tripping. I was like, damn, this is hard for me to say. The groove with you is better than this song. Um, all right, then you got the Summer Breeze. Is the literal groove is better. The, the actual <laughs> groove of the song is better. <laughs> Summer Breeze versus. Uh, uh, be ever wonderful. Now that's summer breeze. That's summer breeze. It's your thing versus devotion. Devotion, man. I mean, come on, man. I, I, yeah. Earth, Wind, and Fire was killing. They came out swinging. I mean, it ain't like Earth, Wind, and Fire don't got got records. It's just like I don't. I feel like I feel like the Isleys could have gotten pocket better quicker. How about this? Through devotion, bless the children. Come on, man. that record. Man, all right, and then they got um, <laughs> make me say it again, girl. And then after the love is gone, I was conflicted on that one too. I gotta go no, with after, after the love, the love is, gone. is gone. That's after the love is gone. Yeah, and then footsteps in the dark, shining star. That's definitely footsteps in the dark. Footsteps in the dark. Uh, twist and shout, boogie wonderland. That's twist and shout. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They, this is the run. That's what I'm saying. They went yeah. on a little run. Choosy Lover. And then you got uh, On Your Face. Of course, Choosy Lover on that. That's what I'm saying. So they went on the same run, Mike. This is what I'm saying. Earth, Wind, and Fire had their run early. This is the Isley Brothers run. Voyage to Atlantis. Uh, Brazilian Rhythm. Obviously, Voyage to Atlantis. That's my favorite that's Isley true. Brothers song. That's, oh, it, it is. But, Mike, that's four in a row right there. They yeah. They already won some. Yeah. Here we go they again won. and Sun God. Uh, goddess, I gotta go with Sun Goddess on there. Sun Goddess, yeah. Man. Um, work to do. <laughs> I'll write a song for you. I got work to do on that one. Yeah, um, they won. 
I mean, they won. I'm not saying they crushed them, but I feel like they won. Between the Sheets, Serpents of Fire, Between the Sheets, definitely. Uh, For the Love of You, with Free, For the Love of You. Don't Say Goodnight, Can't Hide Love. I might have to go with Can't Hide Love. Hold on, what was the first one you just said? Um... Oh, my bad. Uh, where we at? Oh, don't say goodnight. Over can't hide love? I got ooh, it. My, ooh. Yeah, yeah, my, 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 mm-hmm. my, no, 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 no. I know the songs. That that might be the toughest one. I would That's call tough. it a tie. That would be my draw. That would be my draw right there. <laughs> Andre like, Shashir said love, holiday, and groove with you is a tie. I try not to do ties, you know, but this one, it had Andre's some... Right. Hold on, Andre's right. That's the other one that I was thinking about was closest to a tie. But if, if I was on a tie somewhere, those would be the two times. It would be right here. But but like I said, Mike, I, I prefer the Isley record more. I just do. Smooth sailing, fantasy. I like guitars, Mike. I'm a Prince fan. I like guitars and shit. Well, you know, this is the thing. This is kind of like another era's version of Jodeci versus Boyz II Men, right? Like, you lean more towards the Isley Brothers, who would be more of a Jodeci in this matchup, than Earth, Wind & Fire, who would be more of a Boyz II Men, because they're so musically sound, fundamentally sound, I harmonizing. So, I think it's so unfair to Earth, Wind & Fire to compare them to Boyz II Men. I'm not <laughs> comparing them to Boyz II Men. I'm not. I'm just talking about how musically sound they are. Their the stuff air. is perfect. And, and, and the style yeah. Of the Stylistically, Boyz II Men did everything perfect. Their harmonizing, their melodies, uh, you know, even the way they constructed songs. But with Jodeci, it's just a different feel. And I think you're not going to find a band better than Earth, Wind & Fire. But the feel, yeah, but the feel that the Osley Brothers bring is a little different. That's what I'm saying. It's a whole vibe. Yeah. It's a way. It's a groove. That's the only thing I'm comparing. I'm not comparing them to Boys to Me, like, but like, I'm just like, saying. Like, sometimes, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, like, like Mike, sometimes when you listen to their stuff in succession, it takes you somewhere. Like when you listen to Footsteps in the Dark, mm-hmm. the groove, which at your best. Yeah. Like when you start waving on that consistently, you'd be like, man, these are the best motherfuckers that did it. <laughs> yeah, man. Voice to Atlantis is, I mean, God. Voice to Atlantis, that's what I'm saying. Like, you start riding their wave, you'd be like, man, ain't nobody better than them. I'll always <laughs> come back. Man. Wow. So, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that they, one, honestly. And, like, and, like, and they got the cool look to go with it. Like, it matches up. Yeah. Like, the whole skis matches up. Mike, when you see them, you're like, and that's exactly how I thought they would look. Right. <laughs> I had a good time with that versus, though. You know, I hope we end up getting the Jodeci boys to men thing, but hey, I, I don't I, know if that's going to happen. Can I, can I say something, though, right quick? Yeah. Like, I didn't like Steve Harvey responding to people. Like, to start off like that. It's <laughs> like, first of all, like, and, and he's a legend in his own right. Like, you're not a yeah. legend of the status of, of the people who you're presenting. And so any time that you're taking to make it your time is taken away from their time and you're the host, so you need to be mindful of that. But also, too, you're just too grown to be responding to people that's younger than me on Twitter who don't really even know who they are and barely know who you are. What you mean he was responding to people? Like, like, I guess you know, I missed that. You start off talking about, you know, people want to know why Steve Harvey is the one hosting da, 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 and all yeah. that. Like, you know, that was in response to, like, people... It's like, don't be, don't be 60 something years old. Stop responding to some 23 year old on Twitter whose grandparents was like listening to this shit, like literally. I like Steve Harvey's commentary because, you know, he's, uh, you know, he, it's like, he's like your uncle or like your pops or something. You know what I'm saying? Like, y'all don't know about good music type thing. You know? uh, <laughs> it was cooler than him, God rest his soul. And he damn sure didn't respond to 25 year olds on Twitter taking up airtime when Earth, Wind and & Fire and Isley Brothers were the thing. Who was that? I'm just saying. I'm, no, no, no. I just said my uncle was cooler than him. Yeah, but uncle. Uh. <laughs> but, but no, no, no. I just, I just didn't like it, Mike. I didn't like the vibe because also too, it was like also too. It's like this is Isley Brothers and Earth, Wind and Fire. Why are you talking about some sort of confrontational piece? You get what I'm saying? This is a kind of a love movement kind of thing. Well, one thing I will say about this, and I don't think that they really anticipated this um, when they put these two bands together. You can't cut them off after one minute. You know what I'm saying? Like, you gotta play these songs. I mean, you I know? wish they would have thought about it further because 
truthfully, this should have been um like full fledged three hour concert set mm-hmm. up with like two separate stages for both bands. Right. Right. Cause let's like, talk about this whole versus thing, man. You know, obviously it was set up originally for producers to play like a minute of their track. And okay, you play your track, whatever, whatever. And then when it started to reach out to the artist, it's like, okay, it's cool for rappers because you got 16 bars, right? And you got a hook. So that kind of takes up a minute. But we're talking about full-fledged bands now where solos are coming in. This was not meant for this format. And DJ D-Nice, you're not going to cut off of Osley Brothers or Earth, Wind & Fire record one minute in. Like, how are we going to do that? Hey, hey, Mike, Mike, some of these songs don't start to like a minute six. Exactly. <laughs> they don't start singing to like a minute or two in. <laughs> and you know what's so funny is the fact that, you know, you would think that all these people being music people, they would know this ahead of time. It seemed like it wasn't until Steve Harvey told them, like, you can't cut these off after a minute, that they actually extended it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because the first couple of ones... DJ D Nice was cutting them off after a minute, and Steve was like, "Oh hell no, you can't be cutting these off after a minute." You just can't run on Isley four bars. You can. <laughs> I'm sitting here waiting for the guitar solos to come in. I'm like, man, nah. You like if we're gonna be doing this tonight, I don't even want to listen to this. You know what I'm saying? Mike, once again, what are we doing? What versus what are we doing? <laughs> what we doing? Versus like, is on the Mike, fly. Mike, 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 it just be open season on versus with us. It's like what they doing? What we doing? Mike, yeah. What we doing? Yeah, we're y'all, just gonna be making up stuff as hold we on, go. Hold on, hold on. <clears throat> Didn't he say that we need to sit back and wait and see and let things unfold? So this is how you letting it unfold. You not giving our legends like <laughs> stage. Yeah. And band time and yeah. proper track listing. Like, okay, like like who's organizing this? Do you have an event manager for the evening? Well, like, this is the thing, you're right. These matters with your basic ass. If you're gonna if you're gonna sell <laughs> if you're gonna sell this to big business, right? Well let's have a <laughs> like you said, a concert setting to show for it. Okay, this was sold to Trilla, but this looks the same exact way is the Monica and Brandy thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, what's different now? Now, you had the opportunity to do something very different because you have a very incredible band like Earth, Wind & Fire, and you have an incredible band like the Isleys, and they basically just sat on the couch. Mike, they're not just incredible bands. They're two of the best bands ever. I think they are. Specifically with Earth, Wind & Fire, arguably the greatest band ever, I think. If we're just talking about live ensemble stage performance presence and bringing everything to the table, what we doing? Were you on that thread uh, where everybody was talking about Outcast is better than the Beatles? I threw up my little emoji right quick, but I seen all the smoke. What do you think about that? Because personally, I think Earth, Wind & Fire, Parliament, Funkadelic, and the Isley Brothers are better than the Beatles as well. I mean, I think it's interesting that people throw Outkast in that conversation, but there's a lot of bands from back in that era that we need to talk about being better than the Beatles first. Parliament, Funkadelic well, being one of them, in my let's opinion. Unpack, let's unpack a few things. So, so you want you want to dig into a few things? Let's start with the Beatles, because let's start with what's outside. Go ahead, go ahead. Part of, um, part of their brilliance is in the fact is that they were making full-length quality album players when almost every other piece of music being made at the time was single-driven with just clutter-filled material afterwards. Yeah. So whereas guys were making six, seven-track albums and really only two or three singles and the rest of the songs weren't that good... These guys were making full-fledged players of album that had cohesion, sequence, mm-hmm. song structure. Thanks. A lot of the they, so people have to understand that the Beatles are essential to the album making process of music. Exactly. Albums get made differently because of their process. Part 
Like, like Mike, you have to like, know what music like, was like before the Beatles to really you appreciate. You have to know what music is like before the so you actually have to know music and know what music is like before the Beatles to know it's just not the hit records. It's the way the albums were put together. And so, it was the fact that they put them together too because at that point you had a lot of artists, like you said, with the albums that were coming out then, there were a lot of covers on there and they would throw them on there with a few original songs. But they would take, it wasn't a lot of original material, and it would be stuff written by other individuals, put on the artists, uh, other musicians. I think the Beatles being self-contained, where they were the writers, the arrangers, the composers, and they, they put together and recorded a full album in one day as well. They did that too. So, so I don't want to... So, so understand that they're great. That's what black people in black culture need to understand about the Beatles. I think too often, there are too many black people that talk about the Beatles that haven't heard the Beatles music. They haven't listened to Sgt. Pepper's. They haven't listened to the White Album. They haven't listened to Abbey Road. So they really don't understand. So here's the best way that I can frame it or compare it. If you were to go to take the Beatles' first four albums and the Isley Brothers' first four albums, and Earth, Wind, and Fire's first four albums. Here's what I'm going to tell you what you're going to find. You're going to find that the Isley Brothers and Earth, Wind, and Fire at their peak make better records. As in, you're probably going to find in those four albums about five to eight records on the Isley Brothers records and on Earth, Wind, and Fire's records that's better than all the stuff on the Beatles albums, okay? Mm -hmm. But after those five to eight songs, Mike, you're going to find out the Beatles make albums and that they got about, like Mike, they got about four albums. They got about ten tracks on them that are brilliant. Mike, they got they, they people don't know they were cranking out songs, but they were self-contained. They were self -contained. and Mike. And here's another thing people don't understand too. Like they cranked out material the way Prince and Stevie Wonder cranked out material. Definitely. I mean, they said as in like as in like you heard them every eighteen to twenty four months without fail for about ten to twelve years. So it's like. And it wasn't Mike, and it wasn't five or six track albums. We talking about, like Mike, I don't even know if anybody was making 13, 14, 15 track albums consistently before them. Right. Is it the, was there a double album before the White Album? No. They took, they, they actually got the mainstream out of the doo-wop era too. Um, Thank I'm, you. They, they changed all that do the twist and all that bebop, all the, uh, all the barbershop quintet. Quartets, yeah. The, all, all the sitting in your stool and singing with the cigarette in your hand and shit, that shit was over when they came. Mm -hmm. Straight shit up game changers. But yeah, you're right. I think that a lot of people don't really understand that type of um, impact. Um, I mean, like, like a lot of us don't give Larry Bird his proper credit. You just think that, oh, okay, you know, he gets pumped up because he's a white dude. Larry Bird was fucking nice. Larry Bird was incredible. Who been out here talking shit about Larry Bird? Like, <laughs> you know how people movie. be talking like Larry Bird just wasn't dope. Like he wasn't hey, that dude. I want, everybody, I want everybody to understand this right now. If Larry Bird was playing right now, he would go put 50 on LeBron and talk shit to him the whole time <laughs> he was doing it. He would put 50 on him and there'd be nothing he could do about it. Because when he played in his prime, there wasn't a black dude out on the court then that could do anything about it. Like that's, that's Listen, crazy. I mean, I tell people this all the time. Like his, career, his career was short in comparison to almost everybody else that he's compared to, and he's still a top 10 player. Yeah, definitely. This is what I tell people when they talk about people have gotten faster, stronger, and all that. At the end of the day, look at what Luca's doing out here. Imagine what Larry Bird would be doing. I mean, if people do understand that, like, Larry Bird's career averages are, like, 25, 10, and 8. Ridiculous. He averaged more rebounds than his power forward and center, and both of them are Hall of Famers. Yeah, and more points, Mike. From the small forward too. position. Mike, Mike, yeah. Mike, he averaged more assists, too. He averaged more assists than Dennis Johnson and Danny Age. That was the point guard and the backup point guard. Insane. The only, but the only thing he wasn't doing was leading the team in steals, and I'm pretty certain he did that shit sometime too, and he couldn't jump a fucking lick. Yeah. I mean, he could do everything else. 
And, I mean, people look at Larry Bird and they think three-point shooter, three-point shooter. He was an incredible rebounder, playmaker. When people, about, hold on, when people talk about how brilliant LeBron is and how great his basketball IQ is, understand that Larry Bird is that equal and maybe exceeds. And one of the few people that can say that. Larry Bird's a genius on the basketball court. Oh, definitely. Definitely. You have to be, you know. And again, I think that those type of things on the basketball court, and I know we've gone all around the world in this conversation, but those type of things on the basketball court work in any era. Look at what Kevin Love was out there doing in Minnesota. Oh, you want to know? <laughs> I love KD, Mike. Like, I'm actually more than I am a LeBron, a LeBron fan, but I'll tell you this right now. Like, if I'm ranking small forwards on time, I still got KD at three. Because, like, Larry Bird won three straight MVPs. Yeah. Larry Bird, three rings and was, like, I think he got two finals MVPs. Like, Kevin Durant's close, but, like, that's how great Larry Bird is. Like, like Kevin Durant isn't clicking on LeBron's heels. He's clicking on Larry Bird's heels. I love Kevin Durant, right, as an individual. But I think that him winning. Bird's a better passer and rebounder than Durant. Yeah, I think Kevin Durant winning with Golden State didn't prove anything to me as him being a quote-unquote winner as Larry Bird winning with the squad that he had against that Laker team. Uh, okay, so I'm going to tell you this. Like, first of all, KD's never played in the finals where LeBron wasn't there waiting for him. So Larry Bird never had that to deal with every single time. Yeah, he had Magic Johnson and Kareem to deal with. Not every single time. He Damn near. He got Houston one time, Mike. Yeah, yeah, he got yeah. Houston one time. He did. He did. No, 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 no. So, like I just said, KD has gotten LeBron. Every time KD's walking to the finals, LeBron's been on the other side of the court. And and, and chances are, this year, LeBron is healthy. Like, like Yeah, he's he probably going to be there. there. You don't think... Right. You don't think in the finals, Larry Bird going up against LeBron, you don't think he would get the best of LeBron in, in the finals? Oh, I do. In the finals? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, in the finals, I'm taking Larry Bird. I would like to see I would like to see Durant really get LeBron straight up though, without all this reinforcement. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like, oh, oh, first of all, first of all, first of all, that's not fair to say that about him when the first time they played it was an unfair advantage because 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 yeah. Russell Westbrook, because Russell Westbrook and James Harden weren't Russell Westbrook and James. No, no, Harden. I agree. I ain't even counting that. I'm not counting that at all. Well, that's no, no, honestly no. kind of like that's, when. Oh, Mike, 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 that's LeBron's first ring. That counts. But I'm just saying that's kind of like when LeBron ran up on the Spurs his first time around. Shit happens. You know what I'm saying? So, right. You know what I mean? It is what it is. So, so here's what I mean. It's like. Kevin Durant averaged 30 points a game in that series, and people act like he did nothing. <laughs> no, no, no. That was, He wasn't going to win that one regardless. You know what I mean? I don't right. think anybody... Nobody holds that one against him. Like, no one holds uh, the Eric Snow Cavs losing up against the Spurs against LeBron. No one holds okay. that against so, so, so he goes to Golden State. So so what do you think? So, if, <clears throat> so is, it, is it straight up now? What, is it straight up now? Are you talking about the team that has Kyrie, um, <laughs> James Harden, uh, Blake Griffin, and um, LaMarcus Aldridge? Whoa, 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 back up, back up. Let's back up. First of all, why are people talking about Blake Griffin and LaMarcus Aldridge? Like, they are, you know what I'm saying? Like, first of all, neither because one of them like, no. they're, oh, they they're fourth the and fifth fame? options. Mike, like, are they going to the Hall of Fame, Mike? Because right now, I'm not even sure either one of them is even going to the Hall of Fame. So let's stop talking about them like they No, 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 no. We're going to talk about them like the perennial all-stars who have now been pushed. No, no, no. But hold on. So that's why people got to back up. They used to be perennial all-stars. But still, though, Coop, they used to. No, 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 no. Anybody who used to be. Anybody who used to be a number one option becoming a number four and five option, you're going to thrive. Oh, word? Yeah. Hey, Mike, I'm glad that you're saying that. There's this guy <laughs> who used to play point guard. His name is Dennis Johnson. He was the MVP of the 1979 NBA Finals for the Seattle Supersonics. He was the fourth or fifth option on three Celtics championship teams, and nobody takes anything away from Larry Bird. Now, That's that. real. 
That's real. Yep. Listen, Dennis I will. Johnson. Listen, I I will oh, say this. Hold on, hold on. Dennis Johnson had an MVP award, a Finals MVP award before Larry Bird did. Larry Bird didn't even win the MVP in his first Finals. Cornbread Maxwell did. Larry Bird didn't see an MVP till '84. So he was playing with when he won his first ring and MVP at the same time, which was '84, which started his string of re- three regular season MVPs too. He won. Regular season MVP, uh, um, finals MVP that year. That was 1984. On that team, Mike, he had, if I'm not mistaken, Cornbread Maxwell, Dennis Johnson, Robert Parrish, Kevin McHale. In 86, they added Bill Walton. Yeah, they they did. Stacked. He played, he played so so understand in 84 and 86 he had guys in Dennis Johnson and Bill Walton that were fifth and sixth options that were former finals MVPs and league MVPs respectively and Bill Walton was so great as MVP season he didn't even play 70 games and still won the damn award that's who Larry Bird but played. you know no, I'm just tired of Bill Walton was, like, he, like, he was like, hurt like, though like, like, Mike, do you know how many Hall of Famers Magic Johnson played with? Yes. So, so, so when you're talk- talking... Magic had Kareem. Teams, That's all we need to know. Loaded teams have been around, Mike. Like, like Magic Johnson walked into Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bob McAdoo and then fucking got James Worthy a few years later. No, like, no, 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 no. They got James Worthy as the first pick. They won the championship no, and then went saying. to the draft and got the number one pick after winning a championship. So when people like KD went to a loaded team, it's like shit. So did Magic. So well, did Bird. Yeah. Nobody, uh, nobody this is the thing, though, Coop. Coop. This is what makes it different, and you gotta admit this. No. He no, went no. to a seventy-three and nine team. No one did that. Bill Mike, Walton was washed. Mike, Let's keep Mike, it real. Mike, he went to a seventy-three nine team that realized something that all of us really knew basketball knew. Oh, there is no really beating LeBron unless you got KD. Well, I guess KD felt the same way. There's no beating no, no, LeBron Mike, unless Mike, I get... Mike, go look at the last 10 years of basketball. You're not beating LeBron if you don't got KD. You don't, matter of fact, Mike, you don't have much of a chance if you don't have KD of beating LeBron. So, so what does that make, make LeBron? It the makes goat? what he is. I mean, he's... I think it's fair to say that even if you think... If you prefer some people... Like, I would take Kobe or Larry Bird or Magic myself for a game mm. or just probably in a vacuum. But if we're talking objectively, Mike, you can only put Jordan ahead of LeBron. I don't if think that there's anybody who, I mean, because all these guys are younger than him, too. I think we have to consider that as well. Like, all these guys are really teaming up to beat a guy in his 18th season? Wow. No, hold on, Mike, 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 Mike. Let's back up the team. KD was out last year. The team-up was supposed to happen a year ago. And KD is only like three years younger than LeBron. So it's not like a big, big age gap. It's not big, big. Is he Matt, only like, three years younger? Yeah. What like, season like, is he in? Because he was drafted like, in what, 08? Hold on, hold on. 03 to 07, four years. Matter of fact, Curry, so Curry is actually a year older than Durant because he played more college ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out there. So when you're talking about those guys, they're three and four years younger than LeBron. So they're not like 25, Mike. But the thing is, Larry Bird, Larry Bird and Magic had to deal with Dr. J and Moses Malone, and you know what I'm saying. Isaiah had to deal with Larry Bird and Magic, even though they were a couple of years older. He still got his. Nobody not. Nobody said when Isaiah finally beat Larry and Magic, oh, they a couple of years older. Nobody said that. Well, this is the thing, man. It's like, I mean. What KD was drafted in the same year as Al Horford. Al Horford just got put on the injured reserve list for being old. So <laughs> these guys were drafted well after LeBron. If they're considered old, how old is he? And the no, fact that he's in his 18th season now, it shouldn't take all this to be a guy in his 18th season. Let's oh, just be oh, honest. Mike, 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 when you're saying all this to beat him, who is Anthony Davis to you, Mike? Because Anthony Davis like is modern- great. Okay, okay. so Mike, to me, he's the modern-day version of Kevin Garnett. I think Kevin Garnett is the second or third best power forward to ever pick up a basketball. So he's not playing some average 
basketball player. He's playing with somebody that when he plays well is arguably a top three player, as in you could like pencil him in right after KD and LeBron when he's playing at the top of his game. I like, like Anthony Davis a lot. But no, no, no. When Anthony Davis is on top of his game, he's better than Kawhi and Giannis. So are you so taking LeBron Anthony playing, Davis – are you taking Anthony Davis over Harden and Irving? Okay, so here's saying something. <laughs> How tall is Kyrie? Hold on, how tall is Kyrie? Like 6'3 six, 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 three. Three or something, yeah. Six, three. How, how tall is Harden? 6'5? Mm hmm. Like 6'6 six, six or something. Okay, so Anthony Davis and Kevin Durant at their size are not as skilled as Kyrie and James Harden, but because of their size, oh, their impact is so much greater, especially in the playoffs when the games slow down, teams have time to focus on you, and nuances of things matter. And here's what I'm saying, and this is proof positive. Have you seen Kyrie or James Harden really win in the playoffs without a big man or another star player? No. Because James Harden won finals. Who was the star player, Mike? Kevin Durant. Kyrie went to one finals. Who's the star player? So, hell yeah, I'm taking Anthony Davis over both of them if he's on his game because it's playoff basketball and don't nobody and can't nobody stop Anthony Davis. Okay. All right. Well, I know we're, we're running over. Stop, there's, there's, proof, there's proof you can stop Kyrie and James Harden in, in the playoffs. There ain't no proof you can stop AD when you're going in the playoffs. There ain't no proof for that. I don't know how we got on basketball, man. But, I don't um, either. Yeah, rest of the I love it. <laughs> Yeah, man. Rest in peace, DMX. I know we got to get up out of here. We're running over time. But yeah, um, definitely uh, going to be listening to a lot of, um, you know, it's dark and hell is hot and just everything in succession. I want to listen to some of the more recent stuff, too, because I know that recently he signed the Def Jam. I want to say that was in 2019 and they were working on some things. They did a, um, you know, he did a whole GQ spread and everything. So there was going to be a rollout for X. I believe there's some new music that's probably going to be put out. And since he signed to Def Jam again, more than likely it's going to come out through Def Jam. Um, but yeah, um, I do want to listen to some of the uh, like tales from the dark side and stuff like that, man. Things that I ain't heard in a minute. Yeah, yeah. you got me wanting to dig back through some of that old murder ink stuff. You remember when Def Jam used to release the little CDs that came with it too? That would have little mixtapes. That's how Ja Rule got his buzz. Yeah, you know, that survival of the illest type stuff, right? Survival of the illest. There it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I remember one day, dude. Look here. This is no lie. This is when I knew they had made it. They was on MTV, like, remember when MTV used to do that, like, up to the minute, like, 10 minutes before the hour or something? Yeah, 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 they, yeah. They had Ja Rule and DMX out by a Jeep one day, shirts off, bandanas on. I was like, oh, nigga, we made it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, yeah, man. Um, I appreciate everybody tuning in and chiming in, too. Uh, make sure you go subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, we can get all the other episodes where you can hear us giving X that love from weeks and weeks and months ago because we had that album rank really high and uh, we did do our top 25 MCs list and that's in the uh, in the YouTube portal too and make sure you go get the yearbook man actually you know what I know I just got in a color version man can you see that no I can't so, yeah yeah so here's the let's see let me, let me get this on the camera before we Get up out of here, but it's uh. I got a black and white sample copy in the background. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, oh yeah, yeah, I got the black and white one there. But yeah, this is the yearbook in live and in living color. So, um, definitely go on Amazon and order that. And we'll be doing a lot of things with that coming in the upcoming weeks as well. So, we will holler at you next week. Uh, hopefully. Oh, Andre Shashir said y'all never responded to my email. I got your email. I'll get that sent out to you. Um, yeah, I got your email. I'll get that sent out to you. Sorry about that. First thing Monday. All right. Well, you have a great weekend, sir.